Then only mode. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Danielle Jarshevsky. I am the North American editor for Labels and Labeling magazine. And I'm going to be your moderator today for the Digital Wine Label webinar. We're very excited to have you here with us. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. And as we're giving a few more people some time to jump on the wire here. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please send them through the control panel. There should be an option for you to open up the questions area and uh, send questions through, and we will answer them at the end of the session. Uh, you can anticipate the webinar to be over an hour. We're expecting it to be about an hour and 15 minutes. And just another suggestion as well, to keep your mouse active as you're going through the different slides. Um, sometimes if your computer is in sleep mode, um, it may, may go into sleep and then actually disconnect you from the webinar. Um, so just to get started, uh, I'd like to give everybody a little bit of background um, on labels and labeling. Labels and Labeling was founded in 1978, and it delivers labor industry news, trend reports, technology evaluations, and case studies to over 24,000 label suppliers, label converters, label designers, and brand owners in over 114 countries. The idea for today's webinar was to share and create a bridge for communication between these different stakeholders in the value chain. Just want to point out, too, that quite a few of us on the session today are uh, active in social media. So we do encourage you, if you do participate on Twitter, to share some of your thoughts and some of the key points maybe that you might take, take back to your business with you um, following wine labels, pound wine labels. You can also find us on Pinterest, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So I'm very excited to introduce you to our panel of experts that we have with, with us here today. Our first speaker of the day is Jim Gordon. He's the editor of Wines and Vines magazine. He's been covering the wine industry as an editor and reporter for more than 25 years. In 2006, he became editor of Wines and Vines, which is a media company for North American winemakers and grape growers. He directs the editorial content of the magazine that comes out in print, has a website, and participates in social media. He was managing editor of Wine Spectator for 12 years, and, it, and the editor-in-chief of Appalachian Wine Country Living magazine for four years. And he is based in Napa, California. Our second presenter of the day is Tony Hamilton. She's the director of marketing at ASL PrintFX. Tony has 10 years marketing experience with beverage and alcohol companies such as Diageo and Constellation Brands. ASL PrintFX is based in Toronto, Canada. And for two years in a row now, ASL has won the TLMI Best of Show Award and subsequent World Label Awards for its innovation in printing wine labels. The converter takes a prime label and turns it into a value-added product that connects with the consumer and increases usage. Our third presenter of the day is Catherine Didalka. She's the Director of Creative Services at Constellation Brands Canada. Catherine is a graduate of the Ontario College of Art and Design, and she is the driving force behind the award-winning Creative Services team at Constellation Brands Canada. Catherine and her team execute a diverse range of design projects for more than 70 brands, and her team continues to set new benchmarks for design in the wine and spirits sector across an expanding range of platforms. Catherine has more than 25 years experience as a graphic designer, illustrator, educator, and creative director, and has executed thousands of successful creative solutions for an impressive range of clients in both the public and private sectors. Our final presenter for the day is Matt Rompala, He's the Business Development Manager for Wine and Spirits in the Labels and Packaging Division of Avery Dennison. Matt's primary focus is on supporting converters, designers, and brand owners as a decoration consultant. 
His actions include delivering insights around labeling trends and success stories, providing labeling recommendations to maximize return on investment, and on packaging redesigns. And he also helps deliver value-driven packaging innovation to the North American wine and spirits industry. So, to kick us off for the day, I'd, I'd like to invite Jim Gordon, the editor of Wines and Vines, to start us off. Okay, just getting on to the PowerPoint here. Well, good. I'm happy to uh, be here with everyone. Uh, I want to get us started by laying kind of a foundation for the discussion that will follow. Uh, as uh, Danielle mentioned, Wines and Vines is a media company and a market research company for the wine industry. Uh, we're the monthly magazine, of course, and we've been doing that since 1919. And we've added a few more uh, contemporary uh, services and uh, products in recent years, of course. Um, I want to take a look at the size of the wine market in uh, US and Canada and then talk about the number of wineries and the brands and hence labels that they have that gives you a little background uh, for what's to come. As part of our market research uh, functions, we collect data of our own and we analyze a lot of data from other people. So we're very up to date on what's happening with wineries, wine sales, and among wine industry suppliers. So let's just start with a look about at the size of the U.S. wine market. This is from Wine Institute. This gives you sort of the totals uh, yearly in a case uh, volume consumed, sold, consumed basically in the U.S. from all sources. This is the kind of business you want to be in that shows such steady long-term growth for 12 years. The, the total in the U.S. wine market now is more than 360 million cases worth about $35 billion. And in Canada, the Canadian market uh, consumes about 50 million cases of wine uh, uh, recently, which is somewhere between 5 and 10 billion Canadian, I believe. So this, and also uh, the U.S. is the number one market in the world now for the last couple of years. And uh, we've become more and more the target of uh, imports as well as domestically produced wines. And that kind of sets the stage for the competition and the importance of having great packaging, great labeling. Went a little too fast. Okay, there we are. Um, this is probably more impressive than the growth in the wine market. This is the growth in U.S. wineries over the last generation, basically. Uh, wineries really took off in the after the millennium, and even and, and as wine production has obviously increased, the number of wineries has increased much faster. Uh, and if you look at the, the numbers, you realize each of those wineries has at least one brand, and many have several. So that gives you an idea about the domestic competition. These come from our own uh, uh, data bank, and we keep these very up to date. Uh, now, to now, so today we have more than 7,400 wineries in the United States. That includes virtual and bricks and mortar wineries. And now Canada has 529 wineries total. This is interesting to look at the U.S. wineries by size. It's uh, a very interesting picture, which is logical when you look at it. But at the top, we have the large wineries. You go across, there's only 49 of them. But they handle 83% of the case production of uh, U.S. wine. Going all the way down to the bottom, the limited production wines, wineries, make less than 1,000 cases. And there's many, many more of them. Uh, so even though the, the brands that you see everywhere across the U.S. are somewhat limited, regionally, 
and locally there are literally thousands of wineries competing for the consumer's attention. And I had a number in Canada, there's one winery bigger than 500,000 cases, which is uh, Constellation slash Niagara Cellars. And there, for just under 1,000 cases, there are 164 wineries. So there's a lot happening there as well. This is interesting to look at the top 10 new brands of 2012. We're getting this from the market research company, IRI. And this shows to me how dynamic and interesting and fun uh, labels and branding is right now. You know, in my basically 30 years covering the wine industry, it's, I don't think it's ever been this exciting and changing and uh, just sort of, it's, it's a creative explosion that's been happening in the last couple of years. So, you know, look at the, the now usual but unusual names and labels of the top uh, growth brands from last year. These are the brands with the biggest volume that are growing at the fastest rates, basically um, off-premise. That's the top five. Here's the six through ten. But you didn't used to have Thorny Rose and Ooh La La and Flirt. You had, you had the names of trees, ridges, mountains, and kind of stayed pictures of the wineries and chateaus. Uh, now it's a whole new ballgame. And this was my attempt to uh, add up the proliferation of wine labels. If you have 7,500 some U.S. wineries, that's, that data is six months later than my slide, uh, or, or more recent. And then those wineries also have 3,150 other brands that aren't the winery name. You have more than 10,000 active U.S. wine brands, not counting Canadian. And it's hard to say exactly how many import brands there are, but there's a few thousand. That equals a lot of competition. It sort of underlines the importance of having smart design, uh, smart printing of labels, and your whole package. This is just a brief commercial uh, for Wines and Vines. We can help wineries and suppliers find each other and we largely do it through the Wines and Vines directory slash buyer's guide. That's just an example of all the listings and information we have on suppliers and services in several categories related to labels. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'll uh, turn it off for now. We're going to have time for questions later. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jim. So today I'm going to talk about how to make your wine label striking and stand out from all that competition Jim just mentioned. We'll begin with some basic label design development, followed by insights on a key consumer market. Then we're going to review some different printing processes and finishing options. I'm also going to discuss a few additional marketing options that you can build into your wine label for ongoing communication to your consumers. First, we're going to start with a quote that summarizes the place of marketing in wine today. Wine is fashion, and beverage aisles are our one runway. Wines, like fashion, have reached a point where marketing and merchandising play as important a role as making the product yourself. Labels are your billboards. I've assembled four slides that replicate you walking through the aisles and how big the bottle would be displayed on shelf. If you're running through a store, you should be able to recognize these top brands. Let's see how you do. This brand started in the year 2000, and three years later, it was the number one U.S. import brand. All no yellowtail, the start of the critter phase. This bottle started the craze of Pinot Grigio, Santa Margarita. This wine has been part of the Italian premium winescape for over 80 years, Ruffino. 
And with this iconic black bottle, they started the cava popularization. Prisionnet. As a printer, our job is to partner with the winery and to ensure you optimize your revenue and increase your sales. Your label is the reason you'll sell your first bottle to a consumer. Your wine is the reason they'll buy a second. Previously, the label would convey all the vintage details. Now, front labels are almost clean. Remember that your label is your ad. You'll have about three seconds to grab their attention and have consumers pick up your bottle. When you're working on design development, think of three things. Number one, ensure your design reflects your wine or your winery's unique selling points, whether that's organic or something about your vineyard or yourself. Make sure your label is something you're proud of and reflects your personality. It should also appeal to your consumer market. We'd all love to be profitable by selling to our friends, but you need to ensure your label appeals to who's going to buy it. It's a really fine line to walk sometimes. The Matsu wine label that you see on the left-hand side demonstrates what the winery is all about. Three generations of winemakers, three different styles, each with a unique taste. The second thing to think of is who your consumers are. Millennials will shop completely different than baby boomers. I'll go into this in more detail later, but for example, if you're trying to catch baby boomers' attention, you need to ensure your typography is legible. Once they pull out the reading glasses, you delay that purchase decision. Dark colors on dark bottles, again, difficult to read and will slow down the purchase decision. And lastly, make sure you differentiate yourself from your competitors. Go to the store and forget you're a winemaker. Put yourself in the consumer's mind and look at why your competitor's labels were chosen. Forget about the juice inside, but stand back and determine what would have grabbed their attention. Ensure your label pops off shelf. This can be done with unique graphics, colors, or elements of the label. This special edition bottle of the 2010 holiday season for Moet and Chandon definitely pops off shelf. It was laced in pure gold leaf. They produced a run of 1,743 of these, representing the year of the brand's birth. Definitely different than competition. As I mentioned before, we're going to talk a little bit about an emerging consumer market, the Millennials. Why? They're born in the early 1980s and late 1990s, and they are the largest growing wine market. As you can see in the slide, by 2015, they'll be the largest beverage alcohol consumer at 83 million. They're responsible for all the new growth in the wine category. They consume more wine than beer and spirits. How do they think? Completely different from the boomers. They're internet bred. They're extremely active on social networks. A can-do attitude. They want to make a difference in the world, and they embrace diversity. They're environmentally and socially conscious. How do they spend? Boy, do they spend. They spend more on average for a bottle of wine than any other market, which is great news. This chart shows, on average, more than 70% of millennials spend over $11, mostly leaning towards the high end of around $20, while only 12% of baby boomers purchase wine at $20. For millennials, one in every four bottles is more than $20 a bottle. 44% of crude drinkers are millennials, spending $169 for a bottle of champagne. So we know how they spend. What sort of design do they like? What speaks to them on shelf? Millennials place more value on fun. As Jim referenced, they like quirky humor, interesting names, Seven Deadly Zins and Mad Housewife. They like bold, bright colors and unique shapes. So your name needs to be memorable and fun. Also, women purchase 70% of wine and consume about 60% of it. It's really important to appeal to your consumer, but remember, to make sure your label stays true to yourself, it needs to be a perfect blend, just like the wine inside. What other design do they like? They perform, prefer more modern design, like the large type on the B. Frank wine, or the unique pictures on the Orange Swift wine labels. 
they don't want to drink with their grandfather would. Show them a wine bottle with a traditional look or a chateau, and they probably won't pick it up off shelf. They're an ADD personality, fast and simple. Now that you have a label design, what's the best way to print it? Each type of printing has benefits and limitations. It's really important you collaborate with your printer to review what process is best for your design and your budget. First option is digital. It essentially takes files your com from your computer and outputs. There's no film and no plates. It's great for low volume and tends to be cost efficient. The second option is offset litho. It's traditionally used for a four color process and text paper. It's usually used in high volumes. Most of the finishing tends to, need, tends to be done offline, but it depends on the technology of the printer. The third option is Flexo. It's used on rolled roll and flat substrates. It's really great for special effects, which are all done online, and tends to have lower setup costs. Lately, more combinations of printing processes have been used. With the advancement of technology, each printer has different capabilities, so it's important to use a printer that leads in innovation. Now that you have your design and your reviewed printing processes, it's time to decorate. This slide shows some examples of labels we've produced here at ASL with different finishing options. The first one is emboss and deboss. Emboss essentially pushes out the paper stock, giving it a 3D or a raised effect. If you see this picture on the top left hand side, you see the word Hildebrand. It's a beautiful soft effect that gives some premium look to that label. Deboshing pushes the paper surface down. Remember that when you do emboss, it impacts your design, so take that into consideration when you're finishing your artwork. For example, ensure if you're embossing a word like the one shown on the top left, that there's enough space between the letters. Die cutting is essentially cutting out part of the label to grab attention by having a different shape, like the Stony Ridge bottle that you see. You can also cut out the middle part of the label so that the color of the wine becomes part of the design, like the Union bottle shown. Foil. Foils usually bring the metallic finish to your label. There are hot and cold foil techniques. Foils are available in several different colors, including gold, silver, and bronze. But there's also holographic patterns. The label you see for girls night out on the far left-hand side, the dress, is a holographic foil and it really helps increase shelf presence and grabs attention. The same center look label beside it just shows the different colors of foils that can happen. Varnish. Varnish is a clear coating that's applied over a label for added protection or to draw attention to an area on a label. If it's in a specific area, it's called a spot varnish. Varnish can come in matte, gloss, or satin. You can see the finish of the gold uh, area on the Sandhill label. All of these finishing techniques used to have to be done offline and online, slowing down the production of your label. Now with new technology, like at our facility, we can do all the finishing in one pass. Ensure when you choose a printer that they have that technology to accommodate it. Remember, you don't need to use all of these finishing options. Determine what's best for your design and what will bring impact on shelf. Just going to briefly to talk about two other marketing options to think of when you're building your label design. This is a label on label or a peel away. It's a really great way to increase brand retention. You can have a call to action on your website. It can show food pairing ideas, promote other varietals you have. You could even have a special promo code with access to pre-buying of new releases. The second thing to think about when you're building a design is to QR or not. Make sure if you're going to have a QR code on your label that you have enough resources to properly support it. You have to have enough people and technology. It does tend to be a great way to re reach millennials though. 49% of millennials who see QR codes scan them. But remember they need quick access and immediate payoff. 
If you're going to add in a QR code, remember to make sure your site is up to date and mobilize your landing page. Keep your URL short. Make sure the content is valuable to them. Give your consumer a reason to scan. Give them incentive on the label or some sort of call to action. The two bottles I've shown here have the QR code built right into the design on the front of the label, but you don't need to be this extreme. It can be on the back. Your printer can help you create and apply the QR code either during your label development or it can be applied after by making a small sticker. Thanks very much for listening. If you have any questions, you can email me directly. I'm going to pass it over to Catherine from Constellation. Thank you. As Jim and Tony noted, wine labels play a critical role in the success of any wine product. Over 52% of consumers purchase wine by the label story. This is a significant number when your label is trying to capture the consumer's attention on shelf. So how does your label break through? Giving your label the confidence it requires to stand out from others is to ensure there's a strong understanding of the label development process from concept to completion. Managing your expectations, knowing the process, planning and collaborating with a team of professionals will provide you with a solid foundation ensuring your label garners the attention required to capture the consumer. As Tony spoke to the elements on the label, we need to note that the color, the texture, the brand, the shape of the label are significant elements that tell the label story and guide the consumer in making a connection. When the connection is made, it's because all these elements come together harmoniously, delivering the right communication. The process that occurs is about design. Often people feel that the design or creative process is a mysterious ritual, when in fact it is very structured and organized process. Let's take a quick step back and examine what design is. Design is, a class, is classified as a problem-solving activity that combines visual sensitivity with skill and knowledge in the areas of communication, technology, and business. Designers are professionals who provide the content connection specializing in the structuring and organization of visual information to aid in communication and orientation. They utilize various methods in an innovative way to create and combine words, symbols, and images to best deliver the message. The role of design in business is to help create products and services that address the needs of the consumers and to visually express the values and beliefs of an organization, product, or brand. For design, it's important to get a thorough understanding of your business in order to deliver a successful solution that's targeted to your needs. This is the beginning of the collaboration process between business owner and design team. The more your team knows about the challenges faced by your business and its consumers, the more in tune their design solutions are likely to be. A great tool that aids a design team in understanding your request is a brief. A brief defines the parameters and the scope of your project. It provides the foundation for creative exploration and defines the story behind the label. It is a living document built collaboratively with the business owner and the design team. Take the time in developing this document as it is essential in building a solid foundation that will maximize your creative label solution and provide resource, cost, and time efficiencies. The brief comes in many forms with varying degrees of content. Here are seven essential topics that should be answered and will provide the design team the understanding to begin concept development on the label design. One to several sessions should occur for both partners to, to solidify the direction. Invest in this time up front. It will garner the best results. Number one is project overview or background. Here you want to include scope of the project, business needs and objectives. The second, category review. About your competition, your pricing, product listing, and some industry trends. Third is your audience. Who are you going to speak to? The details, the age, where do they live, their interests, their habits. Fourth is your company portfolio, your philosophy, the values. This all leads to the inspiration for enhanced creativity. Five, business objectives, understanding the business request. 
and most importantly, the project scope, timeline, and budget. These are critical details to the roadmap to success. Any additional information, such as research and data, can be added. And details of this process can be reviewed in a book by Peter Phillips, which is called Creating the Perfect Design Brief. Once the brief and business contract are approved upon by both parties, the concept development begins. From this point on through to the completion of the label's production, I've outlined four stages in the process to minimize your costs and outline where risk and cost and timelines could escalate. Collaborative work is critical in the final development of the label to ensure expectations are being met and that the utmost quality solutions will be achieved. First is concept presentation. When presented with concepts, make note to check that they answer the brief in your business intent. This is a time to speak up on whether the concepts are delivering or not. Do not wait until you are further into the process as it will prove to be very costly. This is the first stage that requires utmost clarity and complete buy-in by all parties. Once concepts are approved, investment in securing additional partners for legal requirements, copy, images, whether illustration or photography, and print will be required, often at additional cost. Secondly, pre-production meetings, an absolute must. The printer is often secured by the design team. At this point, the design team, business owner, and printer will review the art files for best paper stock, ink, and printing techniques. The printer discusses how the label will run on the press and ensures the design will align with their printing capabilities. The designer requests drawdowns on final stock to test the colors before printing. This is significant as it will provide a more accurate representation of the final label when printed. Making these type of changes when on press can significantly increase your costs. Thirdly, design refinements and final approval of artwork. Have the design team walk you through the composite files or the complete files of the label, layer by layer, color, coatings, foils, to check to see that what was agreed upon in the final design is in fact what will be printed. Complete all testing of drawdowns and review printer's proofs for high-end proofs or have the printer run a test label to get a better visual of how the label will reproduce. Note that special techniques like foil and varnishes will not be replicated in a proof. Estimates and designs are aligned and signed off. Printer receives final files, makes final proofs. This should be the last opportunity and changes to occur and prepares for press. On press, the design team will arrange a press approval to ensure all testing has been captured on press. There may be slight adjustments on the press, for example, color densities. These critical stages are very dependent on the successful collaboration between design team printer, and business owner. Invest the time in planning and executing at these stages. What value do you place on your label? Whether you're producing fewer than 5,000 labels, or in Constellation Brand Canada's case, over 125 million labels annually, an understanding of everyone's contribution and their role in the collaboration, and a clearly defined process with open communications is integral to the development of the wine label's success. Thank you. Hi, everyone. As mentioned, I am Matt Rompala, Avery Dennison's North American Wine and Spirits Business Development Manager, and over the next few minutes I will be presenting how pressure-sensitive labels support designers, printers, and brand owners to develop unique and impactful wine labels that entice consumers and secure brand equity. As we look at the agenda, I will begin by discussing the benefits that pressure-sensitive, or PS as I will refer to them, labels deliver for the wine industry. From there, I will highlight how the variety and quality of materials offered by PS enables great wine label design. Next, I will discuss how adhesive innovation is leading to improved label performance and appeal. And finally, I will highlight efforts underway 
that are improving the sustainability of TS materials. Before I highlight the advantages of PS labels, since a few people may not be familiar with what a PS label actually is, I wanted to take a brief moment <coughs> to provide a basic overview of a PS label's components. Think of PS labels as material sandwiches comprised of three basic components, a face stock, an adhesive, and a liner. The face stock is the actual label material that is printed on and applied to a bottle. The adhesive is a self-contained glue sandwiched between the face stock and liner, typically an acrylic emulsion formulation that bonds the label to the wine bottle. And finally, the liner is the label backing that protects the glue and allows the label to be transported throughout the value chain. PS labels are produced, printed, and applied in roll format. With a staggering amount of wineries now operating in North America and a dramatic shift in consumer demand taking place due to the buying power of millennials, who are forecasted to represent 37% of the U.S. drinking population by 2017, the need for high-quality, impactful label designs is greater than ever. And looking at the criteria important to printers, designers, and brand owners in creating impactful wine labels, PS delivers four distinct advantages. First is around shelf appeal and impact. PS labels are canvases that deliver excellent print graphics and visual effects. Due to the variety and quality of materials available, including many papers with unique textures, PS supports distinct visual, tactile, and sensory effects such as embossing and foil stamping. The ability to select film materials also enables subsurface printing and no-label looks on bottles. With versatility, uh, the broad range of materials available with PS labels also enables unique label shapes and designs not feasible with other decoration technologies. With the help of digital top coating, PS becomes compatible with multiple printing technologies to support varied run sizes and demands. With the ability to pair multiple face stocks, adhesives, and liners, PS also offers unmatched functionality. Whether wet strength properties built into face stocks or adhesives that offer short-term repositionability, the ability to apply labels to wet bottles and improve ice bucket performance, PS supports the growing demands of the wine industry. In addition, specialized PS materials exist that offer unique security and brand integrity functions such as tamper evidence and RFID tracking. The final benefit of PS for the wine industry is around operational efficiency. Due to the adhesive being contained in the label construction and not pumped through a tank, PS labels are more user-friendly for bottling line operators. In addition, PS labeling equipment is fast to set up and relatively easy to maintain. The advancement of thinner liner material also allows for more labels to be placed on a roll, equating to less label roll changes on the labeling line. As we focus our attention on how PS labels enable great design, I want to first discuss the range of materials that are available to the wine industry and highlight a few specific materials that will be covered in greater detail later on in the presentation. Avery Dennison's 2013 Wine Materials Collection features over 60 unique constructions broken down into a range of categories. With a broad selection of traditional uncoated textured papers, there exists a range of materials available to craft distinct and impactful designs that appeal to a broad array of consumers, whether steadfast baby boomers or millennials willing to experiment with new brands. The newly launched Aquastick portfolio featuring the Z3338 adhesive is a selection of eight PS water-resistant constructions that are designed to be labeled on white and sparkling wines where the ability to withstand bottle condensation and offer ice bucket performance are needed. To push the envelope on cutting-edge design, two wood veneer constructions are available for the first time. In addition to the range of uncoated papers, there is a portfolio of specialty coated papers that offer a breadth of unique looks, 
including pearlescent and metallized options. Finally, there is a selection of films, both clear and opaque, that offer superior conformability and clarity to deliver contemporary design options. As I mentioned, for the first time, Avery Dennison has launched two wood veneer materials, white and birch, that open up a new realm of design possibilities. Since, the, since these materials are actually wood and not paper, they deliver a few unique, a unique capabilities that paper cannot. First, these materials allow for unique design effects such as staining and charring. Also, due to the grain structure of the wood, each label produced with the material will have a distinct grain pattern allowing for increased label differentiation. Finally, the wood material can be top coated, allowing these veneer labels to be compatible with both flexo and digital printing processes. The next area where PS enables great design is through the development of pre-optimized materials to support digital printing processes. With digital printing support of varied run volumes, as Tony mentioned earlier, Technology opens the door for wineries to access high quality, distinct design options with the potential for lower minimum order quantities. With this capability, it is no surprise that digital printing continues to grow at a steady rate, steady rate in North America. As the quality of digital printing continues to improve, so too does the ability to deliver premium designs. As you can see with the image on the slide, one of the benefits of digital printing is the ability to deliver a more customized and distinct brand portfolio where each bottle is set apart with unique graphics but still fits within a larger architecture. As the growth of digital printing continues, Every Denison is focused on expanding our portfolio of pre-optimized materials to support printers, designers, and wineries with the best options to meet their label requirements. With millennials adopting wine at a fast rate, the need to deliver wine label designs that appeal to their unique interests is becoming increasingly important. To facilitate these more contemporary designs, a range of new PS materials has been introduced in the past couple of years to offer design canvases more appealing to millennials. Examples of these materials include vibrant white face stocks, such as Royal White, and bright metallic and pearlescent face stocks such as Max Flex Bright Silver and Sparkling Osti. In addition, the usage of clear film face stocks to create designs appealing to millennials is growing in popularity. As white wine varietals are proving to be popular with these consumers, many of the newly launched PES materials offer wet strength performance to support label integrity in ice bucket and cold box exposure. In addition to unique material colors and textures, a broader array of unique label shapes are being utilized to differentiate brands on shelf and increase the appeal to specific consumer segments. To enable this trend, PS is the ideal material choice to support both printers and bottlers with the ability to more easily die cut and apply these unique labels. In addition to unique shapes, we are seeing an increase and label designs that create complex imagery through the combination of clear film and opaque ink varnish combination. In addition to supporting dynamic design, advancements in PS label technology allow for materials to better deliver on the increasing performance demands of the wine industry. As PS label technology continues to evolve, Printers, brand owners, and designers have access to an expansive array of materials to match their specific application needs. As you see on slide 11, this chart highlights the range of adhesive options that are available for the industry, along with their performance across key metrics. You also see that these adhesives are divided between those that could be paired with paper and film substrates. While I will not cover the chart in detail, I wanted to bring everybody's attention to a couple of specific adhesives that have proven to be valuable in the industry. First, on the paper side, the S100R adhesive continues to grow in popularity as it delivers upon key industry performance needs while offering excellent removability under hot water. In addition, on the film side, 
The F7000 adhesive delivers excellent label clarity to deliver no label looks on bottles with larger label sizes and on poorer quality glass surfaces. In terms of new innovations that address unmet needs in the wine industry, I want to introduce everybody to Avery Dennison's newly launched Z3338 adhesive. As the demand for sparkling wine continues to skyrocket, particularly with millennials, so too does the need to label heavily condensated bottles due to the cold filling temperatures of sparkling wine. Over the past few years, we have heard from a variety of brand owners that want to utilize the benefits of PS to promote their brands, but admit that labeling heavily condensated sparkling wine bottles with PS labels is very difficult. In response to this feedback, we have developed and launched earlier this year our Z3338 adhesive, an acrylic emulsion adhesive formulated to, to deliver upon a few key needs in the industry. Named for the typical liquid filling temperature range of sparkling wine, Z3338 offers consistent label positioning on heavily condensated bottles and can be applied at speeds up to 600 bottles per minute. Also, it withstands variable temperatures and human environments as labeled wine bottles move through the value chain. Finally, it offers excellent ice bucket and cold box performance at the point of display and consumption. Currently, we have paired this adhesive with eight of the most popular face stocks being used in the industry and have called this range of products the Aquastic Portfolio featuring Z3338. In addition to delivering innovation that enhances the performance of wine labels for the value chain, Every Denison is increasingly focused upon delivering new solutions that contribute to the environmental health of our planet. These efforts are in turn intended to support the wine industry become more sustainable. When it comes to face stocks, new materials are available to support these efforts. First, we are proud for the first time to offer PS Constructions featuring one of the industry's popular face stocks, Estate No. 8, as a price neutral FSC certified option. In addition, we have introduced two new variations of the popular uncoated litho face stock that are comprised of 100% PCW material. Finally, we continue to offer a tree free paper face stock to the industry as a unique and environmentally friendly option. Expanding from face stocks, another area where we are focused on driving sustainability in the wine industry is through the expansion of materials paired with 1.2 mil PET film liners. While 44 pound PK paper liner is widely used in the industry, the adoption of 1.2 mil PET film liners is growing in popularity in part because of its sustainability advantages. Because the inherent sustainability benefits of the liner material may not be intuitive to most people, particularly since you are comparing a film to a paper construction, Avery Dennison has developed a tool appropriately named Green Print where we can compare our own materials across six key sustainability metrics. As you can see from this slide, we have performed an analysis comparing the environmental impact of both materials for a large wine application. As you can see from the green print summary, switching liner material to 1.2 mil PET from 44 pound PK eliminates the usage of trees. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 17%, the equivalent of taking six cars off the road for a year. It reduces water usage by 85%, the equivalent of saving the annual water consumption of 3,400 people, and reduces the waste footprint by 40% the equivalent of 13 households worth of annual waste. While 1.2 mil PET is not beneficial across all of the green print metrics, its overall score highlights the quantified environmental benefit of using the liner material. As I conclude, I would first like to thank everybody for taking the time out of your busy schedules to listen to my presentation. Hopefully, everybody has a better understanding of the benefits that PS labels deliver in supporting printers, designers, and brand owners create impactful wine labels that help enable further growth in the industry 
and delight a variety of consumers. For additional information on, on any of the topics and materials covered, please feel free to reach out to me directly, and I welcome each of you to visit Avery Dennison's website. Again, thank you for your time. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, to our panel members. We certainly appreciate you sharing some of your expertise and insight uh, around wine labels and how important it is to brand communication. Uh, we did have a, a few questions come in. So um, just to answer a, a question that came in, <laughs> the most popular one, uh, we will be sending out a link uh, for the presentation in the next couple of days so everybody will have access to that. Um, so the first other question was, uh, I'd like to direct it either to, to Tony or, or Catherine first. Uh, how important is it to start thinking about uh, label design and branding um, in, in the development process of, of a winery and of the juice and the brand? In my experience, and in some cases, um, at Constellation, we used to think about the wine label and the brand before even thinking about the contents of the bottle. So excellent. So right now All right. Hello? Hi there. Um, all right. So I guess the next question actually is, is for you, Matt. Sure. Uh, try to put, oh, it's kind of place it on shelf as well if possible, just to see how it looks before you go down that path of final production. Great. Thank you, ladies. Um, I, I believe the next question that we have then is for you, Matt. Um, there were a couple of questions with regard to the wood veneer material that seemed to be um, uh, an interesting material you guys have there. Can you tell us a little bit about how that material might perform in an ice bucket? Um, would uh, Can we expect it maybe to shrink as it dries out? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yeah, and, and I'm glad there's questions on the material. I mean, it, it's the first time that uh, we've been able to introduce uh, something as unique of a, of a substrate. And the way that the, the material is, is put together is the wood is actually laminated to a, a PET film backing. And so what that backing delivers to the material is it helps keep its uh, structural integrity. It's a very, very thin layer of wood. And so even before we... Uh, transform it into a pressure-sensitive construction. It has a, a backing to it that, that allows it to keep its integrity uh, as, it, as it goes through different uh, temperature changes because, you know, as, as it was uh, accurately pointed out, certainly uh, wood will, will expand and contract. And so that backing gives it better rigidity. Uh, in terms of ice bucket performance, you know, it's, because it's wood, uh, it's going to act as wood. And what I mean by that is um, it's not, you know, where some of our papers will have a wet strength additive built in. Uh, the wood doesn't need that sort of additive, um, but some things to consider is how the ink is going to be applied onto the wood, and it will have an, a tendency to seep into the material a bit uh, because of the, uh, the porousness of the wood. But from the and the feedback that we're hearing so far and what we're seeing uh, with, uh, with the material performance, uh, you know, you, you recommend some testing before a design is put on for, for ice bucket performance. Um, but we have, we have seen it looked at in, in those considerations. Excellent. So we've had a, a couple more que uh, questions coming through. Uh, the next one is actually for you, Catherine. Um, how does Constellation select the markets for their products? Um, 
Can I have a few moments to think about that? Absolutely. No problem. Um, I actually have another question for Matt as well, um, and hopefully you have a little bit of insight on this. Um, what would you estimate the usage of pressure-sensitive labels in the North American wine market is versus glue-applied labels? Yeah, with our, our estimation is that pressure-sensitive is about 60% of the label material used uh, in North America. Uh, over the past uh, five uh, or so years, there has been a trend towards PS, I think for a few different uh, distinct reasons. You know, the first being the flexibility of materials, the fact that you can choose a variety of papers, you can choose film uh, constructions, uh, now you can even look at some wood materials. Uh, and with those unique materials and the types of die cutting that's available and the types of uh, label shapes you can produce. You know, with PS, you actually have customized adhesives. You, uh, pressure sensitive uh, allows the industry benefits around the uh, different types of performance requirements, uh, whether it's with uh, different types of uh, hot water removability or if it's uh, looking at improved uh, performance in ice buckets or around certain uh, performance criteria. You know, and the last reason we're seeing growth get it to, to really about 60% of the share, like I said a minute ago, is really around the operational efficiencies it delivers. Because of the piece of, of operation that pressure sensitive delivers, we're seeing that a lot of, uh, of the industry we speak to uh, like its ease of use. And so with that, uh, you know, we represent about 60% right now. Excellent. Thank you. Um, do any of the panelists have a thought on um, the use of PET uh, wine bottles as opposed to glass bottles and what maybe implications may be around um, labeling and design for, for that aspect, maybe with the thought of ease of use and millennials in mind? Maybe for a, a panel of wine, wine connoisseurs. You know, I think uh, I'll, this, this is Matt. I'll, I'll uh, take a take a stab at it. You know, I think with with millennials, what's interesting is they're you know from from some some data and some some insights that that I'm seeing, there seems to be more of an interest in looking at uh, I'll call them uh, different usage usage occasions for wine, and particularly outside of the house, whether it's with some friends at a at a pool party or, or at a picnic by the lake. And certainly when you think about those type of uh, environments, PET delivers benefits from a portability standpoint uh, as best as we want to use that term with wine to, uh, to support the, uh, the expanded usage of and, and consumption of wine. I think the key, though, is looking at it from, from how, what does the quality of the product look like on shelf. I think Tony had the stat earlier of how millennials are willing to, to spend more per bottle than other uh, consumer uh, segments. And, and with that, I think it's very important to make sure that the, the presence and the, the image of the bottles on shelf keep a really high quality look. Um, you know, that certainly glass and, and, uh, and the subsequent labels around glass have been able to provide. I, Matt, this is Tony. I, I tend to concur, especially given the stat of 44% of crew drinkers are millennials. So they're definitely um, leaning more towards glass and are a bit um, sort of status um, posturing coming from a millennial generation. So again, depending on the occasion, as Matt mentioned, um, or the size uh, format, uh, they probably tend to prefer glass. Excellent. Uh, another question that came through, um, which could go out to, to a few of you on the panel, um, for a small winery with a traditional looking label, what are some simple changes that could be made to the design or the material that would attract more millennials without detracting from the baby boomer consumer base? Are there any design trends or material trends? 
um, maybe as far as embellishments that we're starting to see as more wine brands are trying to capture these youngsters? Yeah, this is Tony here. Um, with regards to bridging that gap between baby boomers and millennials, if you do have a traditional label, you know, I would definitely work with uh, a printer to look at options and have them to provide you with some. A few easy options are, you know, changing your type uh, or your font or even um, color of your label without changing the complete design of it. Um, those are a few easy things to do or, or add some texture to it. Um, but definitely font is, is a fairly simple thing to change, but again, depending on how extensive your brand is, might not be that easy to change. So I would definitely work with your printer to have them look at options and provide you with a few different ways of how to do it. And if I can expand on, on that for, for a second, I, I agree with Tony, this is Matt. Uh, I think one simple way to, to attempt to do that is looking at just the, the, the label material itself. For example, if you have a design on like an estate eight type stock or an uncoated litho that is a more traditional uh, stock being used in the industry, if you looked at a brighter kind of brighter white stock like the like a uh, a, a royal white uh, uh, type material, what happens is you see that the that without changing the graph, without changing the design, you see everything stands out a little bit more, uh, and it's it's a tone that's a little bit more appealing for millennials. And so as, as Tony mentioned with, with testing and, and working with the printer, I think also selecting the right material can support uh, you know, transitioning that design to a younger audience. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions for the ladies. Um, the audience is hoping that you might be able to talk a little bit about the price point in relation to some of the quote-unquote chick label type designs and maybe some of the kitschy designs that we've seen. Um, I know, Tony, you definitely touched base on uh, millennials specifically and the amount that they may or may not be willing to pay for wines. Um, could you mention a little bit about maybe the design and price point? Design from a production standpoint or um, retail? Um, so I be believe retail. it's more on the retail side, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it depends again on your market here in Canada. We're completely different than the United States from a retail price point. Um, it, it tends to, again, millennials tend to spend more per bottle than baby boomers. Um, they're definitely willing to pay more for it. Uh, and again, remember that your label is the very first reason they buy your wine and the contents or your wine inside is the second reason they buy it. So it, it, um, they tend to lean more towards the premium side, so around the $15 to $20 average. Um, but they are also you know, definitely looking for good value for money as with any market. Okay. Does that answer the question? In the Yes, I definitely think so. Um, and I think this is probably one final question. Um, I can certainly tell you, Matt, there are a lot of um, eager, eager audience members out there curious about the veneer label. Um, but I did want to address this one uh, about sustainable packaging. Um, the question is, you know, our wine, how, how important is sustainable packaging to consumers? And are consumers and wineries willing to pay for a post-consumer waste uh, material or a FSC certified material? I know you touched base on it a bit as far as um, price neutrality. Can you just um, reiterate again uh, where, where that price point comes in when it comes to the line of materials that you have? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very good and, and certainly a relevant question for sure. Uh, you know, look, I, as you look at you know, the growing impact of millennials, it, it certainly is, you know, as Tony mentioned about the way that they think and the way that they're programmed and the way that they operate, certainly millennials are, are, are more you know, environmentally conscious in their, in their brand selections. But I think at the end of the day, you know, uh, you know price and, and, and price points are still key. And so for us, and I, and I mentioned it earlier, I'll, I'll reiterate it, 
you know, we've been very focused, particularly this past year, on offering uh, you know new solutions to our our portfolio that you know keep uh, as much price neutrality as possible. We've been able to uh, work with uh, you know FSC certified uh, programs and, and make sure that we can offer for the first time at the estate aid face stock, which is a popular stocks used throughout the industry as a price option compared to the non FSC. One and with the uh, the PCW material, you know, what we've done is we've taken the uh, material and offered it in um, both 60 pound and 50 pound options. And so you're able to get uh, not only uh, you know the, the the sustainable benefits from the 100% PCW material, but it's also at a uh, at thinner construction to also reinforce that method. So it's increasing in, in, in importance, but we're very focused on making sure that uh, you know we keep uh, we keep offerings at, at price neutrality to the best we can uh, to the industry, um, so that we can we can enable uh, more throughout uh, throughout the wine industry. I think this is Tony here. If I can add on to what Matt said, if you do to choose to go down the path of um, sort of sustainable packaging or um, uh, liners, one thing to make sure you do is make sure you tell your market that you do that. So as much as you want to relay the specifics of the appellation or if your wine is organic or uh, you do sustainable farming with your grapes, you need to make sure that if you are purchasing packaging that is sustainable to inform your market whether it's on your wine label or on your website, because it is, as, as we mentioned, really key to millennials that you do care about the planet and you are environmentally uh, conscious as well. So make sure you relate that um, and that they're aware of, of how you package your product. Thank you very much, everybody on the panel. Um, we have more and more questions streaming in, but I am going uh, to wrap things up for us today. Um, thank you, everybody, for calling in and taking time out of your day today to talk about wine labels. And uh, we do certainly hope that we can continue the conversation at another point. Um, Thank you, and uh, keep an eye out for our email with the presentation slides for you. And we will also, I know a few people had questions about emails to contact our panelists. Um, some of the emails are on the slides, so you will have access to the emails at that point then. So thank you very much again. I hope everybody has a fantastic summer, and um, we'll sign off for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>